Before I get into today's video, I want to say that I'm probably going to start streaming on Twitch and I want to say that I'm going to start a discord server and both of those things will be on the screen right now and they will also be down in the description below with links to those and the reason that I want to start doing those things is so I can get to know you guys not just over you know YouTube comments and things but you know you can talk to me and ask questions and um yeah, we can actually have real conversations instead of just talking to each other back and forth on these weird comments uh, on YouTube, and it'll just be an easier way to talk to each other. So I'm really looking forward to that. Follow me on Twitch and join my Discord down below. Also, this video is going to be split into two different parts because I realized after writing a script that there is a lot of information to unpack here. And instead of leaving anything out or just having one really long video, I want to just split it up into two parts. So this is part one. Enjoy. And now to get into today's book, it is called Wisdom of the Shamans, what the ancient masters had to teach us about love and life. And this, guys, was a absolutely beautiful and amazing book with so many great teachings in it and you know there's a lot of books out there that are two three four hundred pages long and a lot of those books can be filled with fluff right because these authors they have to meet page quotas and so they just they take a chapter and what they could say in a few pages they end up dragging out to you know 30 40 pages this book is the exact opposite of that this book is roughly about 140 pages long pretty short but every page is just so good and it, it has so many amazing teachings and so many applicable things to your life and i love the way that it's written because it starts out each chapter with a story from uh this the author's family traditions and then this story um is then talked about you know what what are the lessons that you can learn from this what is this story trying to portray and then at the end it actually has exercises that you can apply to your life what are daily things that you can use and i just love the way that it's written because the stories are so memorable which then makes it easy to remember the application of that and then the exercises make it easy to integrate the things that you learned into your everyday life and it is just so such a good book. This book is about the ancient shamans of the Mayan tradition, which is actually pretty similar to the Eastern mystics and just sort of that type of spirituality. They're very concerned with, um, you know, suffering uh, really is the, uh, the greatest problem in life. Everything is one and um, the only thing that exists is the present moment and these forms of you know meditations and mantras and so i thought it'd be very appropriate um, i'm wearing some mala beads for today's video um, which these are more from the eastern tradition but as i said they're very similar so uh yeah figured i'd throw them on for the video so how i'm going to be doing this video is i'm going to be reading the story that's at the beginning of the chapter and then I'm going to be talking about what the author said that this story is about and then I'm going to be sharing the exercises so I'm going to be doing exactly what the book does I'm just going to be doing it in a condensed form so let's jump right into it we have chapter one the eagle and the snake finding your own truth it says a long time ago in the middle of a desert in what is now Mexico, lived a powerful shaman who served as a great leader and helper to his tribe. When he realized that his physical form was dying, he decided to leave one final and very important lesson for the next generation. My time in this body is coming to an end, he told his tribe as they gathered around the campfire one evening. In the morning, you will have to say goodbye to this village. Take only what you need when you leave here. Everything that you don't need, everything that doesn't serve you in life anymore, leave it here. Tomorrow is a great day of transformation. Then, to mark this moment, the old shaman threw some magic dust into the fire and turned the flame into a bright blue cleansing blaze that sparked like the stars in the night sky. He continued, tomorrow 
you will begin your journey to create a new dream and you will roam the wilderness until you see the eagle devouring a snake above the cactus garden. That will be the sign that you have found home. And with that, the old man dismissed the circle and when the morning came, they went to the shaman and found that he was no longer in his body. They packed only the most basic necessities and started the journey to find their new home. The journey was not easy. For years, they walked and walked until finally one day they saw a lake. In the middle of the lake, there was a small island and that island was full of cactus trees looking up into the sky they saw an eagle dive down toward the island where it grabbed a snake from the ground with the snake clutched in its claws the eagle landed on a cactus the villagers watched in awe as the eagle began to devour the snake they were overjoyed because this was the symbol they were searching for they immediately began to build their new home this was the beginning of the great city of the aztecs tenochtitlan i butchered that where mexico city stands today that night the tribe built a great bonfire and gathered in a circle just as they had on the last night of the old dream, the tribe said thank you to the grandfather shaman because they had found their new home, but as they were giving thanks to him for his guidance, suddenly a bright blue spark appeared in the bonfire and they all recognized it as the grandfather's spirit. Hello my children, he said from the flames, I see that you have made the lesser journey and now you must make the greater journey. The tribe was confused for they had spent a long time on the difficult journey to find the location for their new home. What could be greater than this? The voice continued, the eagle is a symbol for the truth, the snake is a symbol for lies, and the cactus garden represents the garden of the human mind. When the eagle of truth devours the snake of lies in the garden of your mind, then you will find a home within yourself, you will find your own personal freedom. So this story was all about self-discovery and self-love and self-freedom. And the question is, how do we achieve this self-freedom or self-discovery that the shaman was talking about? How do we go inward? And the author says is to realize that all of this life is a dream, right? We're just creating stories every single day. And these stories or dreams that we're creating for ourselves can create suffering when they don't align with the deeper truth that's within us. And so a modern example of this would be something like, you know, uh, what if I'm a person and, I, and, and I'm creating this dream, this story about myself, and I'm saying I, I have to go and become a student and I have to do this job and become this type of person. And we go and we become a student and we realize how unhappy it makes us and, and we become miserable with this story that we created and it has created suffering. But when we realize that this is all just a dream or a story that we're creating, then we can direct that path and we can find the path that fits the inner truth that's within us. And the question is, how do we do that? And the author talks about a form of meditation called silent meditation. And this silent meditation is sort of a form of um, intuitive feeling, right? It's not necessarily based in rationality. Um, he describes it as when a mother senses that her child is in danger, right? There's no rationality behind that there is just this gut feeling that says hey i need to go help my child because they're in danger and that's kind of how it is with our life right like we just kind of get this gut feeling of i'm i'm supposed to go do this or i'm supposed to go be this person this is who i want to work towards being and there's no rational reason to want to become this person right you just it just feels right. It, it just feels meaningful. It's, it is a story that creates meaning in your life. So the exercises for this and how you can actually apply that to your life is to first off define what personal freedom looks like for you. What is the story that you could tell about your life that actually makes you feel free and happy and meaningful? And then when you do that, you have to do an inventory check and figure out what old dreams that you're holding on to, right? Because if you're holding on to these old dreams, then you're not going to be able to go and pursue the dream that you want to. And these old dreams are just going to continue to cause suffering in your life. So like I was talking about before, right? If you think about, oh, I have this story in my head that I want to become a student and maybe I want to go and become a doctor. And then you go and you start doing that. You realize that you hate it, that you really just, you know, you want to be an artist, let's say. And, um, you know, when you go and pursue the dream of being an artist, you have to just completely let go of that idea of, oh, I'm actually supposed to be a doctor. I'm not supposed to be being an artist. You have to, you have to let go of this old self that you've been clinging on to. And then the author has a really interesting form of meditation that I love. And this meditation practice is sitting down and it's part of the silent 
knowledge that's within you, right? To find the truth of the story that you want to tell about yourself. And he says, all right, sit down, relax, like all forms of meditation, close your eyes. And what you want to do is listen to the sounds that are in the room, right? Maybe you have a fan on, maybe you can hear your family talking from the other room or your friends or your roommates or whatever. Maybe you have an animal and you can hear them. Maybe you can hear sounds outside and, and listen to all the sounds that are happening. But then he says, and this is really interesting, listen to the silence that makes all of the sounds possible, right? Because there is a silence that's making those specific sounds possible. If there was really loud noises going on that would drown out all those other noises, you wouldn't be able to hear them anymore. So there is a silence there that's making the current sounds that you're hearing possible. And so then start to focus on that silence and then go inward and start to hear your thoughts and the things going on in your head and the noises that are going on in your head. Then do the same thing of noticing the silence in your mind that is making all the sound possible and focus on that silence and just be. And when you just be, this can help you to realize the things in your life that you don't enjoy, the things that you do enjoy, the things that you wish you could get rid of, the new story that you could tell about yourself that you actually want to live. And now on to chapter two. This chapter is called The Riverman, Flowing with the Cycles of Life. And the story goes, a long time, in the beginning of the Second Mayan Empire, there lived a young man who, as the world would have it, fell in love with a beautiful young woman. Fortunately, this was a time in Mayan history when many of the people harbored a great deal of superstition in their hearts, were fanatical about their religious ideas, and because of this, they wrongfully felt it was necessary to sacrifice other humans in order to appease the gods. The young man didn't care for any of that religion or superstition, so he chose to leave the religious fanatics alone and spend all his free time with his beloved. Their love was true love. One day he returned home to learn that his beloved had been selected to be a sacrifice for the gods and the priest had come and taken her away. The young man went running to the temple where the sacrifices were performed, but he was too late. Lying on the altar, with her heart removed, he found his beloved. Grief-stricken, he sank to the floor and wept. Anger grew within him. He was upset at the world. He was mad at God. He was mad at his fellow villagers. He saw they lost. They were lost in their superstition and were killing each other due to their fanatical beliefs. He left the village and went to live alone in the jungle. Because his anger and grief were so strong, he rarely ate or slept and slowly began to die. Finally, he decided to end his life. He went to the rushing river and jumped in, swimming to the bottom in hopes the river would drown him. As he sank down, he had a vision of his beloved. Overjoyed by the sight of her, he called out, My beloved, I have found you. I'm so sorry for what those fanatics did to you and that I was not there to protect you. I'm going to stay here with you forever. I will never leave you again. And then the spirit of his beloved said to him gently, You cannot stay with me, nor will you ever see me again if you continue on this path. You are full of hate, but I am full of love. To be where I am now, you need to stop living in the pain of the past. As long as you hold on to resentments, you are giving your power away, and you cannot be where I am. Those warnings from his beloved startled him, and he awoke to find himself on the side of the river, gasping for breath. He felt the truth of her words and realized the joy of living he had once felt was now gone. It had been replaced by fear and hate. This realization was the moment of his transformation, and he had said to himself, freedom is within me. He looked up to the moon and knew that his beloved was there watching him, guiding him. His heart began to open once again, and he started to forgive the fanaticism of the people. He looked at the beauty of the river in front of him and saw it as a symbol of flowing love. In that moment, he became known as the riverman, the wise person of the jungle. At about the same time, and thousands of miles away across the ocean, a great man of integrity lived in Spain, a soldier by trade. He was known as the Good Conquistador because he had devoted his life to the Queen of Spain in service to his country. He was faithful, loyal subject who always acted with integrity and never abused his power. And that was why all the people, including the Queen, loved him so much. She honored him and asked him to travel to the New World. When he arrived to the New World, he saw right away that the other conquistadors had gone mad with greed and were abusing, torturing, and killing the Mayans in their search for gold, this including killing many of the families and friends of the rivermen. The good conquistador was horrified by their actions. A pious man, he tried to talk to his fellow con conquistadors to convince them to act honorably, but they would not listen. Finally, he said, this is not the will of God. This is the abuse of, abuse of God, the corrupting of God, and I will take no part in it. So he laid down his sword, took his armor off, and fled into the jungle. Before long, he was captured by the Mayans. 
They began torturing him, punishing him for the sins of the other soldiers, and kept him as their captive. The rivermen, who would often come to the village to help take care of his people, came upon the imprisoned conquistador, although they could not speak the same language. The rivermen felt the vibrations of this beautiful man and knew his heart was pure. The rivermen freed the good conquistador and brought him to his home in the jungle, fed him, and they began to learn each other's languages. The good conquistador was astonished by the rivermen's kindness and inner peace. Once they had been together long enough to understand each other, he asked, how did you learn all this knowledge? I can feel God in you. God is in everyone, the rivermen responded, but sometimes you have to look harder to see him. He told the conquistador the story of his beloved, her sacrifice, and what happened to him in the river. The conquistador said to him, teach me to be like you. It begins with understanding, the rivermen explained. When you look at both our people, they are the same. They want happiness, but they create suffering instead. We have found peace between us, you and me. We have communicated heart to heart, and every action we take comes from the heart. We end the suffering of our lives. So this chapter talks about the power of forgiveness, the dangers of fanaticism, the power of unconditional love, and humans' tendencies to the addiction to suffering. And the author goes on to talk about something that's very overlooked, and he says that it is the cyclical nature of time. Now, people tend to view time as something linear, and the author says that this can often lead to us suffering because with viewing time as linear, people will often look forward and they will say, well, there's a linear time in the future where things will be better than they are now, and that creates suffering in the present. Instead, the author says, no, things are cyclical and you are in the different cycles of life that you cannot get out of. And so there's no point in trying to fight against these cycles of life. There is just going with the flow of the river of unconditional love in the different cycles of life. And he talks about the Mayan in the story who lost his lover, right? So he was in the cycle in the beginning of love. And he had this new passionate love for this beautiful young woman and she was taken from him and he was in the cycle of loss or death and grieving, but he was spending so much energy and hate and anger and grief trying to get back to his lover. He was trying to get out of the cycle that he was in. And I like to compare this to something like the cycles of the seasons, right? So summer, winter, fall, spring, and imagine it's winter time and you are spending all of your energy trying to get to summertime, just all of your energy. You're just causing the most anger. Like everyone hates to be around you because you're so angry that it's winter time and you're just investing all of your energy trying to make it summertime right that sounds so silly doesn't it i mean you can't make it summertime when it's winter time and there's no point in trying to invest all your energy into this to be angry and to be hateful you're just in this cycle and the thing is you have to learn to navigate through this cycle and not expend all this unnecessary energy of trying to fight against the cycle. And then the author goes on to talk about this addiction to suffering and addiction to beliefs. And this addiction to beliefs leads to a creation of suffering. And the author says to realize that beliefs are actually real. They're not something out there that you can actually grasp onto. Our beliefs are just all in our head right that's all beliefs are and so we shouldn't cling to them so tightly that it makes us a fanatic that it makes us create suffering that it makes us harm those around us and this addiction to these beliefs just continues to feed our addiction of suffering and it's just a cycle right we 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 feed it one thing of suffering and then that feeds another thing and that feeds another thing and that feeds another thing and we're just continuing down this path of suffering. And the author has a few exercises at the end of this chapter on how to apply these things to your life. The first is to stop and to think about what are the things that you are addicted to that are causing you suffering. And maybe it's too much social media. Maybe it's loving drama and gossip. Maybe it's an addiction to money. Maybe it's addiction to sex. Whatever it is, what in your life are you addicted to that you just keep fanning in the flame, right? And you're making it worse and worse and worse and you're just causing yourself to suffer over and over and over again. What are these things? Can you identify them and how can you break the cycle 
of your addiction to suffering to these. Then he goes on to talk about, say, what are the ways that you're being a conquistador or even a Mayan priest where you're so fanatical in your beliefs that you harm other people and you're fueling this addiction to suffering and you're causing yourself to suffer because you're so attached to your beliefs and you're causing other people to suffer because you're so attached to your beliefs. And he says to work on realizing that these beliefs aren't you, right? They're not you and you don't need to hold on to them so tightly and you don't need to hold them to a point where they just cause you unnecessary suffering. And the last exercise in this chapter that the author talks about is forgiveness. In the same way that the riverman forgives the Mayan fanatics, so too can you forgive the people in your lives. And the exercise that he has for this is to think about the scenarios that people have hurt you right and he says write them out like every detail is like i know this can be really painful but just write it out all the details all the all the emotions that you felt all the pains that you had of this situation caused by this specific person that you've been holding on to and then he says to focus on these emotions that come up these emotions of suffering that you feel by this person or this situation and he says to Picture these in sort of like a, a slingshot, right? These emotions. And when you're breathing in, you're pulling those emotions back. And when you're exhaling, you're launching them out. You're pulling them back, shooting them out. And this technique is something that can help you release all of that negative energy of that you have about these emotions or these people or this these events that have happened in your life and he says you know this this might not help you on the first try right this might not be useful for you um the first time you do it or maybe the second time you do it or the third time you do it but if you keep repeating it and you just keep letting go of all this energy that you're holding on to the situation then eventually you can get to a point where you can forgive and now i'm going to read the story from chapter three the birth of the quetzalcoatl Ignite your imagination and creativity. One particular day a long time ago, Tlaloc, the god of rain, was sitting above a cloud, providing life, giving water to the earth below. Tlaloc looked down and saw a beautiful cave, one that snakes came in and out of to receive the life-nurturing water. But he saw that there was one little snake that wouldn't come out. The snake was afraid of the light. It was afraid of life. It preferred to stay in the darkness and safety of this cave and was too scared to venture out. At first, Tlaloc did nothing but observe. He could see the little snake's fear growing bigger and bigger. The god of the rain was moved. He felt love for the little snake. It was then that he said to himself, I want to do everything in my power to help this little snake come out of the darkness and into the light. So out of his love for the snake, the god of the rain made it pour. He made it rain for days. And those days turned into weeks and months. With every inch of rainfall, more water came into the cave. It began to fill up. The other snakes all simply went outside, but the little snake had to keep climbing higher and higher inside the dark cave to stay out of the rain. He was afraid, and while Tlaloc could see the little snake's fear, he knew that it was only this suffering that would give the little snake the courage to come out of the cave. Finally, after many months of rain and with no place left to go, the little snake had no choice but to come out. Watching the little snake emerge from the cave, Tlaloc stopped the downpour and parted the clouds, and as he did, the sun began to shine through the earth below. The little snake was in awe, having never seen the light or the world outside of the little cave. He marveled at the world around him as he felt the warm heat of the sun. He looked up to the sky and saw the most amazing thing. Beautiful, colorful birds, the Quetzal bird, were flying all around him. He was mesmerized by their beauty and their ability to leave the earth and travel with such grace. But another snake slid next to the little snake and said, You love the bird, don't you? You want to fly like the bird, don't you? You want to be as beautiful as the bird, don't you? And the little snake nodded. The other snake hissed, Forget it. You're just a snake. You'll always be a snake and you were born to crawl. You'll never fly or be beautiful like the Quetzal birds. The little snake's spirit felt broken. Tlaloc was watching this and he blew away all the clouds. When he did, the sun shone more brightly than it had in two years. It was then that something very special happened. The little snake looked down into a pool of water left over from the rain and through the power of the light of the sun he saw his own reflection. And for the first time he saw his own eyes. It was at that very moment that he recognized his true power. With the blue sky reflecting behind his image in the water, the little snake said, I may not have wings, but I have the power of imagination. And with this imagination, I can fly with the beautiful Quetzal birds. I have imagination. And with imagination, I can break any barrier. I can make the impossible possible because I believe in me. The god of the rain smiled at this because the little snake had finally understood his real power and was no longer afraid of the light. Moved by the little snake's journey into his own power, Tlaloc decided to help him more. 
He blew the little snake up into the air and he continued to blow until the little snake was even higher than the birds. As the little snake flew, the snake felt more alive than he ever had before. The little snake was not even afraid when he flew close to the sun. He knew that the light of the sun was the same light that was inside his own self, which he used to be afraid of. Now that he was so high and close to the sun, the light from it was like a magnet, and the little snake flew right into the sun, and they became one, and the moment produced a total eclipse. Then something came out of the sun, but this being that emerged was no longer a little snake afraid of life, but instead the great feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl. He no longer needed the god of the rain to blow on him to make him fly. He had harnessed the power of his imagination and transformed himself into something greater than he was previously by using his imagination and believing in his own power. Quetzalcoatl emerged out of the sun and flew around the world, feeling the beauty, feeling the freedom of life and love. As he looked down, he saw the cave where he'd spent his whole life and thought about the other beings in the world who were suffering like he once did. They did not know their true power, and he wanted to be of service to them. As he flew, he saw the great city of pyramids. He landed in what is known as the Plaza of Hell and said, This is where I will build my temple because I want to bring heaven to hell. I will take heaven with me to any of my brothers and sisters who find themselves in hell. That is who I am here to help. So this story is all about growth and change and how we can often be scared of the light that's within us and the power that we have, right? The little snake, he was scared to go out into the light and fully experience everything that he could become. And then when he went out into the light, he realized, wow, I have so much power and so much creativity to do and be so many different things and all it takes is for me to just be imaginative and be open and and willing to try and to grow and to change and that's pretty much the central message that the author has in this chapter is just stop being afraid to come out of your dark little cave right and, and go out into the light and and let your imagination shine and become what it is that you could become in the world if you would just step out and be willing. And so he has some exercises. And the first exercise is um, he says, write down all the things that you have planned in life. What are the goals that you have or want to achieve? And he says, at first, don't even make these things realistic. Like, just think big, think big, right? crazy big ideas that you don't even think are possible right now in your life but yet they're things that you're interested in things that you might want to achieve someday and then another way he has of fostering this creative energy is to just do things that are creative every day right maybe and it could just be little things maybe it's just dancing around the room maybe it's picking up a guitar maybe it's learning how to play the piano maybe it's just writing poetry that's been in your mind forever maybe it's writing down a story that you have and, and even though these things might not make a huge impact on the world at least you're feeling your creativity and you're doing the things that you love and you're and you're discovering Discovering more about yourself and what you enjoy and the things that you like to do. And then his last exercise is how can you take the things that you're already doing in your everyday life and make them creative? How can you spice them up with that creative energy? And an example that he has, he's like, I know I have this friend who is a janitor, right? And he cleans floors and he has this creative thing of, he says, no one sweeps the floors like me. And, you know, he has this creative way that he swipe that he sweeps the floor you know back and forth and uh he makes it fun and he just has this creative energy and that helps fuel creative energy in all aspects of your life so what is it that you want to create what is it that you want to do what is it that you want to become begin now by just doing something really really small by writing down a goal that you have and picking up something that you've wanted to learn or applying this creativity to your everyday life this ends part one of this book because this video is going to be really long if I do the whole book in one video and so I want to do this in two separate videos. Part one, I hope you enjoyed. I hope that you pick up this book yourself and read it because there's a lot of things that I have to leave out. As I said, each page is just so packed full of beautiful uh, lessons and stories and it's just it's just an amazing book that, that I think everyone um, should read, regardless of if you're listening all the way through uh, my reviews of it and the things that I'm teaching. I still think that there is a lot that you can learn from it uh, beyond the things that I'm even saying. And so if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Stick around for part two, which should be out shortly after this video. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.